Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege and joy it is to be in your presence. We can't think of any better place to be in the world than right here. Father, we ask that as we open your holy word, that you will help us to be reverent in the way in which we handle it. I ask, Lord, that you will give us clarity of thought, that you will help us to understand the serious times that we're living in, so that we might prepare a character fit for heaven. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus, our beloved Savior. Amen. A series on the three angels' messages would not be complete without studying about a very enigmatic group known as the 144,000. Now the 144,000 appear in three very important contexts in the book of Revelation. And what I would like to do is go through very briefly these three places in Revelation where the 144,000 are mentioned because they are critically important places in the book. Now we're not going to read all of the verses because it would take us far too long. What I'm going to do is give you an outline of where each one of the references appears. The first time that the 144,000 appear in Revelation is in chapter 7 and verses 1 through 8. Now immediately before Revelation 7, 1 through 8, actually in chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, you have a description of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Verse 17 ends with a question. And the question is, for the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The answer is in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 8. The 144,000 were sealed so that they would be able to stand. So Revelation 7, 1 through 8 is actually out of chronological order with Revelation 6, 14 through 17. In other words, Revelation 6, 14 through 17 says the great day of His wrath is come, Jesus has come, who's going to be able to stand? Revelation 7, 1 through 8 says there was a group who were sealed before this who will be able to stand. The second place where the 144,000 appear is in Revelation chapter 14 verses 1 through 5. This is the very chapter where we have the three angels' messages. In fact, verse 5 is the verse that is immediately before the beginning of the three angels' messages in verse 6. Now, in chapter 13, going back to the previous chapter, chapter 13 verses 11 through 18, we find a description of the final crisis that's going to overtake this world. It's a crisis over the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name. In fact, we're told there in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, that a death decree is going to be given against those who are faithful to God. That's Revelation 13, 11 to 18. The very next chapter, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, describes the group that were victorious over the beast, his image, and his mark, and the number of his name. They're standing on Mount Zion with a lamb. In other words, they're victorious. So you have a sequence. Revelation 13, 11 through 18 describes the end time crisis over the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name. A death decree is given against those who don't worship the beast and his image. But chapter 14, 1 through 5 explains that there was a group that was faithful to God and will stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. The third place that we find the 144,000 is in Revelation 15 and verses 2 through 4. Once again, we have to go to the previous chapter in order to understand Revelation 15, 2 through 4. 
because Revelation 15, 2 through 4 is the climax of what comes before. Now let me give you a little bit of the context. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 presents the three angels' messages. Immediately after the three angels' messages in verses 6 through 12, in verse 14, we find that the whole human race has been divided into two groups. Those who have the seal of God, those who have the mark of the beast. Those who are spoken of as the harvest of the earth, and those who are spoken of as the grapes. The righteous and the wicked have been separated by the three angels' messages. Then, that's verses 14 through 17, verses 18 through 20, we find the wicked gathering around Jerusalem, that is gathering around God's people with the intention of destroying them. But then we find that some beings that come riding horses, they trample on the winepress. Chapter 19 explains that those who are riding these horses that trample upon the wicked symbolically represent Jesus Christ and His angels who come to deliver His people from the death decree. And then in chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, you have a group that were victorious over the beast, over His image, over His mark, and over the number of His name. So the 144,000, there is no doubt whatsoever, are those who will be alive during the time when the trial over the beast, His image, His mark, and the number of His name is in play. They will be alive when Jesus comes in power and glory, according to the context that we've clearly studied from the book of Revelation. Now we need to take a closer look at this group. And in order to understand them, we need to study the sequence of events that lead to the climax that we spoke about in these three contexts. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to begin with the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6 through 12, to give you the sequence event of events that culminate or climax with 144,000, the living saints in the final crisis that will stand on Mount Zion victorious with Jesus Christ. The first thing that I want us to notice is that Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages speak about the sharing of God's final message to the world in the end time. It becomes very clear that while the three angels' messages are being proclaimed, the door of mercy is open. What would be the use of preaching the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people if there was no opportunity to be saved? It's obvious that the three angels' messages are God's final message to planet Earth, God's final call before probation closes. Now, Revelation chapter 7, and I'm only mentioning the verses because we can't read all of the verses. We don't have the time. But in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 8, we find that while the three angels' messages are being proclaimed, while God's final message is being given to the world, there are four angels that are holding back the winds of strife. Basically, that means that they are holding back the winds of the tribulation. The tribulation has not begun while the three angels' messages are being proclaimed. They're holding back that final cataclysmic time of trouble. They're holding the winds of strife while the gospel is being preached and while God's servants are being sealed on their foreheads. Now, the next event that I want us to notice is that while the winds are being held and while the three angels' messages are being proclaimed, God's last message is being proclaimed to the world, the sanctuary in heaven is open for business. Do you know that we can approach the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers for us today? We can enter the sanctuary by faith if we sin and we repent, and we confess our sin, and we trust in the merits of Jesus, today we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive forgiveness and receive power in our lives to overcome. In other words, while the sanctuary is open, we can receive forgiveness of sin and we can receive power to overcome sin. 
because in the sanctuary is where salvation takes place. While the sanctuary is open, the messages are being proclaimed, the winds of strife of the tribulation are being held back. But we're told in Revelation 14 that as soon as the three angels' messages finish being proclaimed to the world, the world will be divided into two groups. You find this in Revelation 14, verse 14. Immediately after the three angels' messages, you have Jesus sitting on a cloud, the sickle is in his hand, and he's going to harvest the harvest of the earth because it's ripe, and he's going to harvest the grapes of the earth because they are ripe. In other words, the whole world has ripened either on God's side or on the devil's side. Two groups, those who have the seal of God, and those who have the mark of the beast. And the three angels' messages uh, were the instrument through which God divided the human race into two groups. So how important are the three angels' messages? Folks, accepting them or rejecting them is a matter of life and death. If you reject the three angels' messages, you will end up as grapes. You will end up with the mark of the beast, and you will suffer the wrath of God. God doesn't want anyone to suffer His wrath. That's why He warns us. If you receive the three angels' messages, you will receive the seal of God, and you will be found on God's side, and you will be shielded from the wrath of man, who will try to destroy God's people, and you will be shielded from the wrath of God. And then the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14 that the sanctuary will close. In other words, there will no longer be any opportunity of coming to Jesus Christ in the sanctuary. His intercession will be finished. There will be no more room for repentance and confession of sin and trusting in the merits of Jesus for forgiveness of sin and for power. Because all that will have happened when the sanctuary closes. Revelation chapter 22, 11 and 12 describes that very important moment when the sanctuary will close. It says there, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. See, that happens before Jesus comes. Because in the next verse, Jesus says, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So you see the declaration that people are going to still be filthy, they're still going to be righteous, they're still going to be holy, they're still going to be unrighteous, will be given before Jesus comes. The door of probation will close, and then the tribulation will begin, and then Jesus will come at the conclusion of the tribulation. And the sanctuary in heaven will close. Notice Revelation chapter 15 and verses 5 through 8, which describes this awesome moment in history when the sanctuary will close, no one will be able to enter by faith anymore. It says there, after these things, I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. By the way, this is the most holy place of the sanctuary. And notice, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure, bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke. The temple is the most holy place. It's the, ta it's the temple of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the sanctuary. The temple of the tabernacle is the most holy place. And so it says in verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Let me ask you, during the period of the seven last plagues, the period of the tribulation, will anybody be able to enter the sanctuary by faith to have their sins dealt with? Absolutely not. Once these angels open the door and come out of the temple or of the sanctuary to pour out the wrath of God, which is called the tribulation, no one will be able to enter the sanctuary 
That's why we must accept God's message now while the door of mercy is open, while Jesus ministers in the most holy place of the sanctuary. It's important for us to send our sins there to Him now. And then, of course, when the door to the sanctuary closes, the tribulation and the seven last plagues will take place. This is going to be one of the worst periods in the history of the world. In fact, it will be the worst period in the history of the world. It will be a cataclysmic period. Imagine what the plagues will do to planet Earth. Jeremiah saw what would happen. He said in chapter 4 of his book, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And I looked at the heavens. There was no light. In other words, the earth was in darkness. He says, I didn't see any living human being. All the birds of the air had left. In other words, nothing on earth was alive. If you read about the plagues, they will devastate the earth. They will return it to the condition it was in before the creation week. Sores will be over the bodies of the wicked who receive the wrath of God because they rejected the three angels' messages. Their tongues will dissolve in their mouths, is what the Bible says. The sea will be turned into blood. The fountains of drinking water will be turned into blood. The sun will scorch the vegetation of the earth. And then there will be a supernatural darkness. Human beings will be slaying one another. There'll be a global earthquake. Islands will disappear. Mountain ranges will disappear. In fact, there will be a rain of hail. Some pieces of hail weigh as much as 50 pounds. And so the plagues will totally devastate and decimate planet Earth. So you better be sure that you will be protected from the wrath of God by accepting the three angels' messages. As I mentioned, the Bible says that this time of trouble will be the worst in the history of the world. In fact, let's read about it in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 21 and 22. It says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been, been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, by the way, that's 144,000, those days will be shortened. We're being told here that unless the period of tribulation was shortened, nobody would be left alive because this period is going to be absolutely terrible. This period is also described in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. If you look at the previous chapter, Daniel 11, it speaks about the king of the north and his followers, which represents the same as the beast in Revelation chapter 13. It says that they will go out to try and destroy God's people. And a time of trouble will ensue. Notice Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Praise the Lord that there's going to be someone watching over his people. But notice that his people are going to go through the time of trouble. Their faith will be tested, but the plagues will not touch God's people. The wrath of God will not touch God's people. And so it says, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people, notice this is the good news, your people, God's people, the living saints, shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Everyone who was found written in God's book of life because they passed victoriously through the judgment. Those who were pronounced righteous still, those who were pronounced holy still, will be shielded and delivered from this time of trouble. The culmination of this time of trouble will be the second coming of Jesus in power and glory. At the very end of the tribulation, notice Revelation chapter 6 and verses 14 through 17, where this great event, the final event of the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, is described. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. 
and every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Let me ask you, did they really need to experience the wrath of the Lamb? No, because the Lamb was there to save them. The, ram experience, the, the Lamb experienced the wrath of God when He came the first time. He drank the cup of the wrath of God. And if they had accepted Jesus Christ, and they had feared God and kept His commandments and given glory to God and realized that they were in the hour of God's judgment and they had worshipped the Creator by keeping His holy Sabbath and had come out of Babylon, they would have been spared. God warned them. God told them to come out. But now because they rejected God's mercy, the wrath of the Lamb falls upon them instead of the salvation of the Lamb. And then I want you to notice how this scene of the second coming culminates with a question in verse 17. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Where would you expect to find the answer to that question? The great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? I think the very next chapter would be a good place to look. Now do you know what we find in the very next chapter? we find the 144,000. And do you know what's happening to them? They are being what? They are being sealed. The question is, why were they sealed? They were sealed because God wanted to say, these are mine. Don't touch these. When the destruction comes, spare them. Does this bring to mind a scene in the book of Ezekiel? Do you remember in Ezekiel chapter 8? It spoke about a group who had their faces towards the east and they were worshiping the sun, practicing this terrible abomination. And how there was a group in the city that was not practicing this abomination. They were actually sighing and crying. They were sad because of the abominations that were being committed in the city. The Bible says that they were marked so that the destroying angels would not destroy them, so that they would be protected when God's wrath would be poured out upon the city. You see, what happened to Jerusalem foreshadows what will happen on a global scale at the end of time. The Christian world will be worshiping not the sun, they will be worshiping on the day of the sun, which we've already discussed, are very, very similar in principle. They will have the mark of the beast. They will the blood of innocent people like was being shed in the city of Jerusalem. But God will have a remnant people who have the seal of God on their foreheads. And of course we have identified this seal as God's holy Sabbath. And God by this seal is going to say, these are mine. Do not touch them. Protect them in the midst of the tribulation. Let's read about it in Revelation 7 verses 1 to 3. This is immediately after the question, the great day of His wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. See, the wrath of God has not been poured out at this point. The winds are being held. This happens before Jesus comes. Notice verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And then you have a mention of the 144,000 and the 12 tribes of Israel. And so some people say, see, these are literal Israelites over in the Middle East. Because 12 tribes are mentioned by name, and there's 12,000 from each tribe. So it must be referring to the literal Israelites over in the Middle East. But you remember that in our previous lecture to this one, we spoke about Israel. Israel is not local. Israel is global. 
Israel is not literal. Israel is spiritual and worldwide. Whoever has joined Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is Israel. This is not speaking about the literal tribes of Israel. This is speaking about God's remnant people all over the world. Now I'd like to share with you a quotation from a very famous expositor on prophecy today. He's one of the best known authors on Bible prophecy. I disagree with practically everything that he ever wrote because I don't think that it's in harmony with biblical prophetic principles. But I want to read two statements from his writings to show you how inconsistent sometimes people are when they interpret prophecy as we find it in Scripture. This is what he says. By the way, his name is Dave Hunt. You might have heard of him. He says this, Some suggest that the Vatican will move to Babylon because he believes that the Roman Catholic papacy is the harlot of Revelation 17. In that sense, he believes the same thing as the Adventist church, the same that we've been studying here. So he says, some suggest that the Vatican will move to Babylon in Iraq when it is rebuilt. But why should it? He asks. The Vatican has been fulfilling John's vision from its location in Rome for the past 15 centuries. In other words, the harlots sit in a, seated on many waters. He says, that's Vatican, that's the papacy. And the papacy has been fulfilling this prophecy for the last 15 centuries. And then he says, moreover, we have shown the connection to ancient Babylon which the Vatican has man maintained down through history in the paganized Christianity it has promulgated. As for ancient Babylon itself, it wasn't even in existence during the past 2,300 years to reign over the kings of the earth. Babylon lay in ruins while pagan Rome and later Catholic Rome, the new Babylon, was indeed reigning over kings. Now what's interesting about this quotation is that Dave Hunt says that Babylon is not literal Babylon, it is to be understood symbolically of a worldwide system. Did you catch the point? Babylon is spiritual. It applies to the papacy and it is global. In other words, Babylon cannot be taken literally. But he says, and Revelation speaks about Israel, Israel has to be literal. Now you tell me, what consistency is there in that? Babylon was the great enemy, enemy of Israel. So if Babylon is spiritual or symbolic and worldwide, Israel, the enemy of Babylon, must also be symbolic and worldwide. Are you following me? Now let me read you the second statement. God is foretelling His final judgment upon a great evil which began at the Tower of Babel and which has only grown as politics, religion, and science have become more sophisticated until finally the whole world is united in the pursuit of Satan's ancient lie. This is Babylon, revived and headquartered in Rome that will be destroyed never to be inhabited again. So once again, he says Babylon is worldwide and it's a symbolic system. So why isn't Israel also symbolic and global or worldwide if it's found in the same book of Revelation? Now the Bible tells us that God's faithful living saints, the 144,000, are going to be marked for death. During the tribulation, there will be a death decree over their heads. Let's read about it in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15. Speaking about this beast that rises from the earth, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? to be killed. So whoever doesn't worship the beast and his image or receive the mark, there will be a death decree against those people. By the way, do you know where this whole scene comes from? It comes from the story of ancient Babylon. Daniel chapter 3. 
Let me ask you, in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 4, did Nebuchadnezzar for a while live like a beast? Yes, he did. Did he raise an image? He most certainly did. Did he command everyone to worship the image that he had raised up? Yes. What did he say would happen if people didn't worship the image? They would be what? They would be killed. Does that sound familiar? It's very similar to Revelation 13. Only in Daniel chapter 3, this is happening in literal Babylon with three literal Hebrews. And this is a literal image. And, the, and Nebuchadnezzar lived for a while as a literal beast. At the end time, it will be a symbolic beast raising up a symbolic image that will be global in scale and will command everyone to worship. Are you with me? And Israel will not be literal Hebrews, it will be spiritual Hebrews or spiritual Israelites. By the way, did the three young men go through a severe time of trouble such they had never seen in their life? Yes, they were thrown into a burning, fiery furnace, heated how many times more than before? Seven times more than before. That prefigures the period of the plagues. It's the worst period in human history, the worst tribulation in human history. But what happened with those three young men who stood before the beast and his image and refused to practice worship? What happened with them? Jesus himself intervened and he delivered his people from certain death. Is that what's going to happen with God's people on a global scale at the end of time? His spiritual Israel who will be condemned to death by spiritual world, by Babylon. Absolutely. And of course that group are called the 144,000. And as I mentioned before, the culmination of the tribulation period will be when Jesus Christ comes on the clouds of heaven to rescue his people from certain death. Let's read about it in Revelation chapter 19 and verses 11 through 16. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 16. It says here, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He comes for the battle of Armageddon because the wicked want to destroy his people. He's going to intervene to deliver his people. By the way, this is Jesus Christ. He is the one who is faithful and true. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. By the way, this is not his own blood. Symbolically, he's come, coming to trample the wine press. He's coming to destroy the wicked because they wanted to destroy his people. So it says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, these are the angels, clothed in white linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Jesus Christ and his armies coming back to planet Earth to rescue his people. Verse 15, now out of his mouth, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And now I want to show you, biblically, that when it says that his garments are stained in blood, it's not his own blood, it's the blood in the winepress of his enemies. Notice what it says in verse 15, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself, listen to this, treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, one of the great problems in the Christian world today is that there's this teaching out there that Christians are going to be raptured out of this world before the tribulation. Now let me ask you this question. If there was going to be a hurricane hitting in Florida, would you prepare for it in Fresno? Of course not. Because say, that doesn't affect me. It's not going to hit here. And so Christians are certain that they're going to be whisked away. They're going to be snatched away to heaven. And then the Jews are going to be left behind. They're going to suffer this horrendous time of trouble. 
such as the world has never seen. But they're going to be surprised because they will find themselves on this earth during this period of terrible tribulation and they will not have the necessary faith to pass through this period victoriously because they were not expecting to be here. Are you understanding how serious this teaching of the rapture is? Listen, if you think you're going to be raptured to heaven, you would never prepare for the tribulation, would you? Because you're thinking that you're going to be in another place. By the way, the Bible tells us that the 144,000 will be a special group. They will have a special character. They will have a character that is victorious over sin totally and completely in their lives. Some people say, oh, it's not possible to, be, to gain the victory over sin. Only when Jesus comes will Jesus transform us and he'll change us. The Bible teaches that it is possible to overcome sin fully and completely. Of course, people say, well, pastor, are you perfect? And of course, the answer is, Pastor Bohr is not perfect. But whether I am perfect or not is immaterial. It makes no, no uh, sense to say that one can only be perfect if Pastor Bohr is perfect. My perfectibility does not show whether you can be perfected or not. The Bible teaches that God's people will live a life without sin. After all, they will not be able to go into the sanctuary to take their sins there to Jesus Christ. They will have to have the total victory over sin. And they won't do it themselves. They have no power to do it. They will do it because they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They will do it because they depend on Jesus Christ every instant of their lives. Let's read a few passages about the 144,000. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 1 through 5 describes the sterling character of this group. Here John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the live, four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. And now notice their character. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Don't worry. If you're married and you live until Jesus comes, you can be among this group. When it says that they are virgins, it's speaking spiritually. They did not actually embrace the teachings of the harlot and her daughters. Those are the women that are mentioned here, because marriage is honorable. If a man and a woman marry in harmony with the standards that God has established, there's nothing defiling about that. What this is saying is that these 144,000 were not defiled with Babylon and her daughters. They did not drink her wine. They did not embrace her doctrines or her practices. Notice what else it says about them. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. See, that's why they're victorious over sin. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're like Enoch, who walked with God. And the walk was so close with God that finally God said, Enoch, you don't have anything more to do on planet Earth. You don't belong down there. You're not a citizen down there. Come, come to heaven, and we'll walk the street of gold together throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. That's what the 144,000 are like. Their life is totally and completely full of Jesus. And so it says, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And now notice, and in their mouth was found no deceit. The word deceit is pseudos. In their mouth was found no lie. They spoke only the truth, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What a character! You see, they beheld Jesus in all of His glory. 
and they reflected the character of Jesus. See, they accepted the three angels' messages, folks. They kept the commandments of God. They had faith in Jesus. They feared God. They gave glory to God by revealing His character to the world. They left Babylon. They did not worship the beast. They didn't worship the image. They did not receive the mark. In other words, their loyalty was only with Jesus. Now, do you remember that question, the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Do you know that that question is asked in other places of the Bible as well? And immediately after the question is asked, you have once again a description of a group that has a sterling character. Notice Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2. But who can endure the day of His coming? See the same type of question? Who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? For He is like what? A refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. Does Jesus want to cleanse us and purify us? Does He want to make us fireproof in our characters so that when He comes, we are not destroyed by the fire, but we are spared like the three young men in the fiery furnace? Absolutely. Notice Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. You know, many Christians think that the wicked are going to burn in the fires of hell forever. Do you know that the Bible teaches that it's the righteous that are going to live in the fire? You say, now what? You say the righteous are going to live with the consuming fire? Yes, it's the righteous, not the wicked. Because the Bible, as we've studied, says that the wicked are going to be returned to ashes. Satan and his angels are going to be ashes. So they're going to go out. But the fire that consumed the devil and his angels and the wicked will continue to exist because the fire is the glory of God. Now notice Isaiah 33, verses 14 through 16. Notice the question again. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Notice the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions. He who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Is there a sterling character described here? Once the question is asked, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Then you have the sterling character of those who will dwell with the everlasting fire. Notice Psalm 15, verses 1 through 5. Once again it begins with the question, followed by the sterling character of a certain group. It says there in Psalm 15, verses 1 through 5, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? By the way, his holy hill is Zion, and the 144,000 are standing on Mount Zion. Notice the answer. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. That expression is the first angel's message. He who swears to his own hurt, in other words, when he promises, he keeps his word and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, which means excessive charge of interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. In other words, he will be able to stand. Once again, the question is followed with what? With the sterling character. God's end time generation will have a sterling, spotless character that fully reflects the image of Jesus Christ, the 144,000 living saints. 
And I don't have time to get into the fact that the number 144,000 is a symbolic number. It represents a much larger group than exactly 144,000. Notice Psalm 24 and verses 3 through 6. Once again, the question, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. You see, folks, in order to stand when Jesus comes, there's a special preparation that needs to take place. I want you to notice several texts in the New Testament that speak about this special preparation that should be made now while the door of mercy is being opened. You know, folks, the three angels' messages have the intention of preparing that kind of character for the coming of Jesus. The three angels' messages teach us the everlasting gospel. They teach us the need to fear God, to give glory to Him, that we're in the hour of His judgment. We should prepare a character to pass through the judgment, that we should worship only God, not our things. We should worship the Creator by keeping His Sabbath. If we're in Babylon, we should get out of Babylon, and we should beware of worshiping the beast, His image, and receiving the mark. Those three messages actually prepare God's people to stand in the great day ahead. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who are those who will see God? Who will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. Who are the ones? Those who have what? A pure heart. By the way, if you have a pure heart, you have pure actions, because actions flow from the heart. Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, out of the heart come adulteries and homicides and all of these things. So if your heart is pure, your life will be pure. Notice Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Once again, speaking about the second coming of Jesus. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What do we need to have in order to see the Lord? holiness according to this. Notice verse John chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. First John 3, 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. When He is revealed is His coming, by the way. We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And notice what we need to be doing, because we're going to see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him does what? Purifies Himself just as He is pure. So if you have this hope of the appearance of Jesus, what do you do? You purify yourself just as He is pure. And do you know how that happens? By beholding we are changed. By what we watch. By what we hear. Folks, Christians watch what the world watches. They listen to the same kind of music that the world listens to. They go to the same places of entertainment that the world goes to. You'll never reflect the character of Jesus if you're watching violence and illicit sex and you're listening to swearing and to lying on television. You'll reflect the character of what you're watching. And no one who is in that condition will be ready to receive Jesus in power and glory because you have, must have a pure heart. You must have a pure life. That's why the 144,000 are described as having a sterling character that they prepared before probation closed. I want to read once again Revelation 22, verse 11, and also verse 12 that we read a while ago because there's a little nuance in translation that is not found in the King James Version. Revelation 22 and verse 11. He who is unjust... The King James, New King James says, let him be unjust still. Really, the Greek tense of the verb says, let him continue to act 
unjustly. In other words, it's not a state of being unjust, it is acting unjustly. And it's reflected in many of the modern versions. So he who is unjust, let him continue to act unjustly. He who is filthy, let him continue to act filthily, is what it really says in the Greek. It has to do with actions. And then it continues saying, he who is righteous, let him continue to act righteously. And he who is holy, let him continue to act in a holy manner. And then of course, when that happens, it says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. There's one final passage that I want us to take a look at before we bring this to a close. It's found in the book of Joel, chapter 2. And it has the same question that we noticed in several other passages. By the way, we don't have time to read verses 1 through 10 of Joel 2. It's describing the second coming of Jesus Christ, the first 10 verses. God is coming with His army to the world. Let's begin at verse 10. The earth quakes before them. This is speaking about Jesus coming with His angels. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. Read Matthew 24. There it speaks about the heavens and the earth trembling. The sun and the moon grow dark. Once again, Matthew 24. And the stars diminish their brightness. This is the second coming of Jesus. And it says, The Lord gives His voice before His army. Those are the angels. For His camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes His word. And now notice the question. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Is that the same question? The great day of His wrath has come. Who can endure this day when Jesus comes with His angels? there's a special preparation that has to take place. And that preparation is mentioned beginning with verse 12. By the way, here it's speaking about the Day of Atonement. We are now in the Day of Atonement, when we should be cleansing our lives from sin through the grace and power of Jesus Christ. So that when the sanctuary is closed, it won't be necessary to introduce sin into the sanctuary. Because on the Day of Atonement, sin is taken out of the sanctuary, primarily at the end of the Day of atonement. Notice what it says in verse 12. Immediately after saying, who is able to stand in this day? God gives the counsel. He says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. This is what happened on the day of atonement. You can read it in Leviticus 23. It's the only day in the Hebrew calendar where fasting was required in the Hebrew feasts. And so it says, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if He will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, by the way, the Feast of uh, the Day of Atonement was announced by trumpets. So this is the announcement of the Day of Atonement. It says, in, once again, in verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast. See, there you have it again. Call a sacred assembly. Everybody on the Day of Atonement had to meet together. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests, these are the religious leaders, folks, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Is there a work of preparation that needs to take place in order for God's people to be able to stand? Very clearly, in all of these passages, we are told that God's people will have a sterling character, not because they developed this goodness, but because Jesus Christ dwelt 
in their hearts because their focus was only and exclusively upon him. You know, some people say, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You know, but I turn that around and I say, you are so earthly minded, you are no heavenly good. I would say that most Christians would fit in that category. They're so earthly minded that they would not even conceive of being happy in heaven because it's going to be so different. There's not going to be smokers. There's not going to be drinkers. There's not going to be partying. There's not going to be uh, dancing in a worldly sense like the world dances today. There's not going to be movie theaters. There's not going to be profanity. There's not going to be any of these things. So if you become accustomed to these things, boy, are you going to feel uncomfortable in heaven. But the fact is you're not going to make it there. Because God is not going to take people there who would be unhappy there. It's now that we have to learn to live the heavenly lifestyle on earth. You know the little chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And what happens as a result? The things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The 144,000 will be totally disconnected from everything on planet Earth, from their cars, from their houses, from their money, and from their expensive toys. They will think of nothing except being with Jesus in the heavenly kingdom, where everything is joy, where everything is peace, where everything is happiness. That is their only desire in their lives, is to be with Jesus. And so Jesus will say, folks, you don't have anything more to do on planet Earth. You're wasting your time down there. Come, and we will walk together on the street of gold. We will go through the gates of pearl, and forever and ever we will live together, and we will sing together. Won't that be a wonderful day? I pray to the Lord that on that day none of us will be missing.